So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today for our new webinar. So today, Alvaro Crevena, head of microscopy at the EMBL Rome, uh, will be presenting how to turn your uh, fluorescence microscope into a special omics platform. Uh, we have with us Dale uh, Clark, Chief Operating Officer at uh, Biopitex with uh, Marine Verrussel, Product Manager at uh, Fluigent, to answer uh, all of your questions. So just a few notes before uh, we get started. If you have uh, any question during the presentation, please uh, use the chat panel uh, available from the top right side of the screen. Our team will answer them right away if possible, or uh, we will bring them up after the presentation. A recorded version of this webinar will be available from tomorrow. And uh, due to the current situation, uh, some of the speakers are uh, recording from home. So uh, we hope not to encounter any technical uh, difficulties. Uh, however, we apologize in advance if uh, that would be uh, the case. Um, I think we can start. So, uh, Alvaro, I give you the lead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll sh start sharing my screen. All right. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Um, so what I what I'm going to do today um, is I'm going to talk about how to essentially turn a sort of a normal microscope into a sort of a, a platform for um, spatial omics. So they're they're sort of very uh, hot at the moment. Um, everywhere you hear about multiplex uh, tissue profiling, you hear about um, spatial transcriptomics. And I'm really just going to share um, our recent experience trying to build these platforms in the hope that they're useful for other people. So um, this talk by no means will be comprehensive. Um, uh, I apologize in advance if I do not quote um, you know, uh, some some very relevant work. Um, so we started working on these about a year ago, and, and it's really just uh, Hello. where, where we are. Yes. Sorry Tell me. to interrupt, but uh, the, the screen is black. Did, huh. you, did you manage to share? Like, are you showing something? I, I did. Yeah. Yes. You so see now, now? Now we can see. Yes, yes, yes. We can, we can see, yeah. And if I do these, wait, do you still see it? No. Ah, huh. Okay, so I'm just gonna, let's just keep this format then. I'm just gonna make it bigger. You, you still see it, right? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, so let's use this format. Um, it's not the most convenient, but most convenient, should yeah. suffice. Should suffice. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Um, all right. So where were we? So the, what I what I want to do today is really to share our experience building these type of platforms. Uh, hopefully, our experience can be useful for other people. So this talk is not intended um, as a sort of a pure scientific sort of uh, question driven talk, um, but more on sort of the practical aspects of uh, setting up these type of experiments. Um, you probably have heard many of this terminology and it's at least it was for me very confusing still is kind of confusing um especially when it comes down to, boils down to which technique should i use how should i set it up um and so hopefully some of these uh details uh that i'm going to present can help you uh decide uh what what is it that you want to do uh and which way you 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 know move forward um just for um, their information, so the talk um, will be, it has already been placed uh, at my GitHub. So you can access the PDF uh, that is, is there. So uh, in case you, know, you want to review some of the papers that I will talk about uh, or have uh, a sort of a, a bit more uh, details on, on the, sort of the, some of the um, devices, microscopes, or anything, uh, sort of any detailed information, uh, it's all in the in the GitHub repository. Um, and just quickly, uh, I'm just going to briefly tell you about myself. So I'm originally Mexican. 
Um, I studied biomedical research and physics, and then I did a PhD in biophysics and molecular cell biology. I worked uh, also as a postdoc and project leader in, in Munich, in Germany, uh, in, in the same areas. Then I had a, a group uh, for about two years in Lisbon. And uh, about a year ago, a bit more than so a year and a half ago, I joined EMBL Rome as the head of microscopy. And since then, uh, we are actually very uh, interested in developing these microscopy based omics. Um, so, just to give you an overview of what I'm, I will be talking about, um, so we'll, I will sort of give you a general introduction into the methods, uh, what they are, um, our, you know, our own uh, experience on sort of choosing what uh, the right methods would be for us. Um, then I'm going to really delve into some of the details of how you actually interface fluidics with a microscope, and you're going to see that, uh, uh, you know, if you, that, that can actually be very simple. Uh, and then I'm going to briefly mention image analysis platforms out there um, that can serve, can really help you to, to analyze your data. So as the head of microscopy, my main, uh, one of my main aims um, is really to, to, to provide access to allow people uh, their experiments, right? So, uh, and, and that's essentially what I want to convey you is that um, it's our experience and, and how, how can you actually do uh, this type of experiments? All right. So um, there are various sort of microscopy based omics, right? They can be thought as essentially the same omics that you have uh, without the microscope, which are proteomics, transcriptomics, genomics, and connectomics. Um, and we're, we're interested in three of them, um, but I briefly mentioned all of them. So in terms of proteomics, that uh, is commonly called multiplex tissue profiling, uh, where you really sort of want to uh, know in terms of space, where are all these markers, where are all these proteins being expressed. Uh, so you actually keep the spatial information. Um, there is a spatial transcriptomics, when it comes to uh, transcriptomics, we sort of really want to locate each RNA species, uh, potentially of the whole genome, uh, so where it is in the, in, 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 in the tissue and, you know, whether that, uh, what kind of information that tells you um, about how the sort of the tissue is being uh, constructed or, uh, you know, what happens in, in disease. Um, genomics, uh, that essentially means you're going to look at chromatin conformation. Uh, there, there are many super resolution methods now uh, that are sort of trying to look at what is the the, the structure of chromatin um, in different cells and uh, with different stresses and, and and what happens during development as well. And so the last uh, connectomics that I will briefly mention is uh, connectomics. So and that refers to how the you know the neurons are actually connected or wired in in in, in, in the brain. Uh, that's particularly important for neuroscience. So I have to say that here in EBL Rome, there are two main um, areas of, of research. One of them is neurobiology, and the other one is epigenetics. And so we are sort of really interested uh, in trying to connect both aspects, the the connectomics and the and the epigenetics. So we're uh, we're very much looking forward to have actually. Uh, our long-term goal is to try to connect. So ideally, you would have a platform or sort of a, a pipeline where you can actually connect all four connectomics uh, on a single uh, on a single sample. Um, so for those of you who want uh, just a bit more on the introduction, there's a very good review uh, by Ralph Jungman from the, from the group of Ralph Jungman uh, that has just been uh, published a, a couple of months ago. Um, so here's the, the reference. All right, so let's uh, let's get into uh, into more details. So what about proteomics? Um, so we want here to localize the proteins in in the tissue, right? And we want to look where they are, which cells they belong, um, and so uh, that is normally done. Uh, this in terms of microscopy, that's traditionally done with immunofluorescence. The problem there is obviously you're limited to four or five colors. That's generally your microscope. And then it's always a question of how can you scale up, right? So potentially you want to look at, let's say, tens or hundreds of markers um, simultaneously in the tissue. And how, how can you do that? Um, and so by no means is, is the question new, but some of the answers to it have uh, recently developed. Um, so one particular approach that I, that I like um, is called PRISM. And, uh, and so what you can see here is essentially what you do is you have a, um, 
an antibody, right, could be your primary antibody that you label with DNA. Um, and so you can use that label DNA as a handle. Uh, and then so you can add the molecular, uh, so the, the complementary strand, and you can visualize that um, and the particular antibody. In this case, the, the validation of the, of, the, uh, of the technique was done with a secondary that was indeed labeled. So essentially, they wanted to localize. Uh, this was published last year from the group of Mark Faith in MIT. But essentially, the idea is that because uh, now you're essentially, you will look at uh, a series of markers in your tissue. Uh, you would add the imaging probe one, and so you would then image that, then you will wash, and then you would uh, then add the next probe um, uh, as you as you sort of carry cycles of these uh, imaging rounds. You're not limited anymore by how many colors your microscope can, uh, can discern, uh, but more for how many different antibodies and how many different DNA strands you can actually add onto the uh, different DNA strands can you uh, can you have on, on the tissue. And so potentially, uh, if you had, uh, let's say, thousands of different antibodies, then you could actually visualize them all cyclically, right? So you can actually do these imaging cycles. Um, another, this is just to sort of try to convey that there's there are other ways to do this. Uh, there's a recent technique called IBEX. Um, where essentially you add adhere your tissue on this on a, on a uh, well slide, um, and then you add antibodies with a particular set of dyes, and, and those then you image right. So here you essentially would be doing your traditional immunofluorescence. Um, you do the, the tra very traditional imaging, but then what you do is you're actually going to bleach with uh, lithium, uh, lithium uh, borohydrate for 15 minutes. Uh, essentially, just clears everything away except the nuclear uh, stain, and then you sort of add another three uh, or four antibodies, uh, primary antibodies labeled, and then you do the traditional imaging again, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Um, this has obviously benefits in the sense that they're simple cycles. You only require a standard microscope or sort of your traditional microscope of choice. Uh, it has limitations. And so for every technique that I mentioned, I will try to mention what the benefits and limitations are. Um, obviously, the limitation here is the, the processing, right? So one, after imaging, this uh, bleaching and tree stain is manual, and you need uh, your primary antibodies to be fluorescently conjugated. Um, uh, another sort of previously published technique was called Codex, um, and there, essentially, you have antibodies that have also DNA labels. Uh, most of the things that we're going to see through um, uh, throughout the talk actually using the uh, DNA conjugated antibodies uh, and it's simply because it's so versatile that it can really sort of add this extra dimension for multiplexing in many many ways uh, and so here essentially what you do is you, you sort of image one at a time one set of antibodies at a time and so that you extend and then you reimage this to the second pair and so on and so forth so essentially again you do these cyclic um, sequential imaging reactions it has a benefit, right, in terms that it can be automated, it can be fully automated. Um, it has a limitation that in this case, your, your primary antibody is not uh, conjugated with a simple 404. It actually has a, a DNA or a set of DNA. Uh, and more complex cycles are actually needed because you need to extend um, sort of the primers that you have there. Uh, this has been turned into a commercial platform. This is commercialized now by Koya Biosciences. Um, uh, so for us, uh, so if you're only doing these type of techniques, the IBEX could be a, a very sort of nice way, uh, especially because then image each imaging cycle is sort of really targeting one particular antibody. Uh, if you want to uh, increase throughput, then perhaps a prism could be a much better way um, to, to go for it. Um, prism has, um, in general, uh, another way, so another advantage that you could actually do also super resolution, and I will talk about that in a second. All right, um, so let's just briefly mention about transcriptomics. And so here the idea is that you really sort of have a, a tissue and you want to pinpoint in space where are each RNA of interest that, that you're looking at. Um, and uh, there are various, essentially there are two methods, there's sort of two type of methods. Uh, one of them is multiplexing methods where you're actually, where you're barcoding, right? So somehow you're going to read out a sequence 
um, based on uh, and the design of your of your probes, um, and that will tell you which particular gene in that that location there is. Uh, the barcoding allows you to multiplex. So Secfish, Murfish can look in the order of thousands or tens of thousands of genes in the tissue or in cells, and so. If you and so the barcoding essentially limits the number of cycles that you can that you have to do in order to extend the number of RNA species that you can actually image, and so that's great, right? So potentially, if you wanted to get to a genome-wide um, screen, it would have to be with one of those barcoding methods. Um, it obviously needs uh, uh, 24 to 50 unique primary sequences on the RNA of interest. And that's essentially what you're gonna visualize. It's a sort of a single molecule um, fish technique. Um, the second, uh, the other type of methods you have are amplification methods. Um, there, there are tons of different names and acronyms. So there's a start map, server fish, barista, uh, and C2 sequencing. And in essence, uh, what you do is you target your RNA, you have some, some probes um, that would allow then the amplification of that uh, particular target, right? So actually you're going to amplify what you're going to visualize, right? So in there are different ways. Uh, I think this branch DNA with these CC probes is the basis of the RNA scope, um, which is commercial solution. Uh, you have also these uh, hairpins. Uh, then you have, uh, for example, these branching or sort of uh, uh, here, so you would you would amplify it like that. You could also do non-enzymatic extensions uh, like server fish. Um, you can uh, do the padlock and then do a rolling circle amplification. And so the the, uh, the, the these might be actually good because you may need less probes um, uh, per RNA, and that might be good for protein that had lots of repeats. Or, for example, for small RNAs, it might be small uh, RNAs that you are interested, or micro RNAs, where there is no way that you're going to get 24 to 50 unique primary sequences that you can target to that. And so, in essence, the amplification would allow to have sort of a reliable signal, uh, but with many less probes. So, in that in that respect, um, so sort of to compare both ways, right? So, um, the multiplexing method requires critics. Um, a single experiment can take anything from, let's say, three four days to sort of a week. Um, only one single experiment can run the microscope at any time. Uh, but obviously it has a great advantage that can give you up to 10,000 genes or more, depending on, on the particular application that you have. Um, uh, the amplification methods on the other hand require less number of probes, do not require fluidics. Um, you can have a single sample needs to be processed seven times and the processing has to be in manual, right? So for example, for in situ sequencing, and we'll talk about that a bit, a bit later. Um, or will it scale with the number of RNA species that you want to look at as uh, the, sort of the uh, single molecule fish or this uh, awesome fish, uh, which is sort of an extension of single molecule fish, or the saber fish, which you amplify with a, with a sort of a concatenator. Um, it has the advantage that multiple samples could be imaged in parallel in an automated fashion using a slide scanner, right? So slide scanners are more or less common instruments uh, in histology and in some core facilities. Uh, and so in principle, within seven days, you could process, let's say, 20 or 30 slides. Um, so within, let's say, the same amount of time, you could produce or have a higher throughput compared to uh, multiplexing methods. Obviously, it has the disadvantage that these techniques, because you are amplifying your signal, you can get optically crowded much faster. So essentially, how many dots you can resolve in space um, and therefore have a limitation of the number of maximum total number of genes that you can see uh, in, in tissue and cells, and this is about a, a, about 200. Um, all right, so in terms of genomics, and I just briefly mentioned this, so how you can actually do this type of experiments, and it's similar to what you would do with transcriptomics, you target probes to the, uh, to the areas of the genome that you're interested, um, and so this is one particular application that was published uh, last year, it's called ORCA, uh, where essentially they target probes for part, parts of the genome, and then the image that they do super resolution, they can target, and then they can do a 3D reconstruction um, of the positions of those uh, along the uh, along the genome. And essentially, what they have is a sort of a polymer-like model of where the chromatin is, um, and then they can see actually that for single cells. So they were doing this in an embryo, 
Uh, and so you have for each cell, uh, you have a particular um, resolution uh, on, in terms of how, how long uh, the, the, the area that you're screening. So this was a 10K, this is a 2K uh, B, and you have these models and then you can compare. Actually here you do have physical distance between domains and not uh, just the reads as you have normally in high C. So it really offers a, a direct way of looking at the, at the uh, confirmation structure of chromatin in cells. Um, these, for example, can be easily combined with probes against RNA. Um, and there is just a recent uh, published paper, I think last week, where they combined these with um, uh, with, uh, with antibody markers, which is just trying to also identify cell types in, in other tissues. So they're, they so the old, most of those techniques can be combined and some have been already, uh, but the idea is that you, you know, uh, depending on the approach that you take, uh, they can be easily combined. Okay, and so the last thing, uh, and this is interesting for, for newer scientists, connectomics. And the idea is essentially, is that we want to solve the problem of scales, right? When we're interested in how neurons are connected across very large distances, right? So normally across brain areas, but the, uh, essentially to really uh, be sure that we have a synaptic uh, connection, we actually require a uh, resolution that is normally um, allowed only by EM, right? So there are a few nanometers of, of resolution. And, and that's it's problematic because not a, sig not a single technique can actually uh, allow to do that. Um, so light microscopy is in general fast, right? Compared to sort of EM where you have to go through years of single uh, 40, nanometer, 40 nanometer thick uh, slices of tissue to try to reconstruct the, the whole volume. Um, and so what, what, we're, what we're thinking to do is sort of to combine some of the uh, issues, uh, the technology available that allows to uh, not only to, to try to address this problem, but also to combine it with uh, some of the other omics techniques. Um, and so one, for example, is, is to do expansion microscopy where you physically, so you, 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 you fix your cell and you anchor it to a gel and then you sort of uh, digest uh, the rest and you physically expand uh, by submerging the gel in water. Um, the issue, the, so the key point here is that expansion microscopy can increase, so it actually physically expands your, um, your sample by factor four. Uh, a structural illumination can increase re your resolution by factor of two. So essentially the combined effect is a factor of eight which might be actually already enough to uh, look at uh, bona fide fit, uh, synaptic connections. And so in principle, you could have the, the capacity to, to sort of scan fast tissue um, with, with actually modifying your, without modifying your, your microscope, right? So this is, this, this is a technique that could work in, in most microscopes, expansion microscopy. Um, for structural relation, you need a dedicated microscope. Um, this, so um, just to show you how this works, so this uh, sample here is a coronal section of a thigh one GFP uh, mice, um, and so the, uh, the 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 size of these is about four centimeters, right? So the, the sample is huge. This image was actually taken uh, with a wide field microscope. Um, but in the moment that then you start to look more carefully at these things, so when you uh, look uh, at it with uh, structural illumination, you, you start to see your synaptic boutons here, right? So uh, your dendrites, um, they're, they're large, right? So we're talking about an order of a micron. Uh, and so try to then localize synapses here will be much simpler than, than you normally do by, by EM. With that answer, you can do actually much faster. Um, the second uh, idea that we had was to try to combine light sheet with DNA paint. So in DNA paint, um, you have it's a super resolution based technique. Um, and so what you do is you actually localize. You can you can uh, do single molecule localization, where the transient interaction between an imager and a docking strand, right? You can then uh, fit that localization to, uh, with a high accuracy, but then you can repeat these steps similar to as we would do prism, right? And then you can localize each of them individually right and so this is a point and i think this is uh, uh this is 10 nanometers that um so the idea um actually of prism was developed out of uh, how dna paint is done in the sense that here as well all you need is you 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 are actually looking at a particular 
uh, imager strand, right? So your complementary strand of uh, DNA that is labeled, right? And it's relatively easy and straightforward to label DNA compared to label antibodies. Uh, but then you can sort of cycle between these uh, and you can actually use the same color. So you're not limited by colors. Um, the problems in terms of turning these into a platform for connectomics is that it's relatively slow, right? So conventional DNA paint will take about one to two hours for achieving a, a final resolution on the order 20 nanometers that you would need for, um, so assessing through uh, synapses. Um, you need sectioning, so no, it's normally done in turf or in hilo. So uh, you also need a DNA conjugated antibody, right? So similar as you would need for codex, for prism, for all of these things, you need a DNA conjugated antibody. And you sometimes, given the technique, you have also a small field of view. Some of these problems might be solved with newer technology, right? So um, there, there are two particular uh, applications of light sheet that might actually provide us in the long term with solutions. So one of them, so both of them are sort of open top light sheet systems. So traditionally light sheet has been used for looking at embryos, uh, sort of really large, th large things. But you cannot just have a light sheet uh, that which you just place your sample on top. Um, and so there, there are two implementations of light sheet. One is called oblique plane microscopy. Uh, similar as to what you have in turf, uh, let's say in high low, right? So before you get into turf. But what you do uh, is you use a secondary objective to image this plane, right? And then you reduce here a different index of refraction to, to sort of reduce the cone to get all this light into and sort of to image across this plane, right? So you're using these as a, <coughs> as a light sheet. Uh, and what is nice is that your scanning will be fast, you have a very large field of view, and this will very nicely work for large tissue. Another application that's actually commercially available, so this is not, this has just been developed, so this was published about a week ago, is, uh, is what is called a, a, a light sheet that you can actually set on top of any inverted microscope. Um, and this works beautifully for cells. So I've actually tested that myself. It all, you essentially have the same field of view that you have for a, for a, a wide field system. So it's a camera based. So you can also scan very, very fast. Uh, the problem is that because you're mounting these, you would not be able to have, let's say, unclear large pieces of tissue because of the effects of uh, light propagation through the tissue that you need. So this works very nice for, for cells. All right. <coughs> Um, so I've talked, I've told you that, you know, for tissue profiling, like PRISM or CODEX, we need the DNA uh, antibodies. Uh, for connectomics, we need, uh, we either want to do paint or we want to do expansion microscopy. And there we might actually want to, to couple uh, the markers with the uh, surrounding gel. And so for all of that stuff, we need DNA label antibodies. Um, so to do that, that's not as, so there are a few protocols out there that's not necessarily trivial. Uh, so one approach that we, we took, um, and so this was, this was actually just published last year, is to try to use a slightly different approach. So we all have primary antibodies, right? Um, um, and so here the, the trick is to use a modified protein G, right? So the protein G here in this case um, has an unnatural amino acid. Um, and you can you can use a sort of a standard chemistry to then uh, modify your protein G. So you have this uh, DNA protein G uh, uh, complex. Um, and then upon uh, excitation with UV, then these uh, unnatural amino acid here will make a covalent bond with the primary antibody on the FC chain. And that's great, right? Because we have an estoichiometric uh, labeling of our antibodies that we can use for anything, right? We can use for flow cytometry as they described. They also do uh, super resolution, so we can do DNA paint. Um, if the and because now, but we now we have the option that we can we can choose what that DNA strand is, right? So if it's this uh, DNA strand is small and the interaction will be transient, then we have a nice tool for DNA paint. We will have a longer DNA, so where the complex will be stable between the uh, DNA strand there and the complementary. And so we could actually do tissue profiling. So it really sort of opens up uh, a bunch of possibilities. Um, and the nice thing with this protocol is that you can actually do this on a bench, right? So you really have bench uh, uh, purification capacity. 
Um, so we, we we contacted the authors and they were very kind and, and, and we got the plasmid. So if you're interested, uh, you can ask me or uh, try to contact them as well. So, um, so all right, so this is uh, sort of an overview of the various methods and, and, um, and what you can do with them. So now we're really sort of going to the details of how we can, or how I actually interface a microscope with a fluidic device. <clears throat> so um, in essence, you, you know, to, uh, to turn your microscope into a sort of a platform that sort of runs uh, automated, you need three things, right? So you need a microscope, you need a flow serial, where essentially you're going to have your tissue or your cells, um, and you have, and you need a pump system and reservoirs. There are various ways of how you can actually do that. And, and, and you know, you can sort of choose a microscope, the flow cell, the pump system. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the microscopes, so I was lucky enough um, to have access, well, I have a, obviously I'm the head of the facility, so, so there are various microscopes. And so I've tested some of these things in various microscopes, uh, and I will sort of give you my um, take home message on, on, on these ones. Um, so I had the opportunity to try this with an icon um, microscope that has a spinning disk uh, unit attached. Uh, we also try this on, the, on a Thunder Invert system from Leica. And then in the new Lara 7 from size that has the capacity to do both a structural illumination and single molecule localization. Um, and in essence, the take home message with these is that to do that with an econ system uh, driven by NICE, it's actually very simple. And I'll show you how. With the Thunder um, uh, from Leica, it's also very simple. With the Lara 7 from size, it is possible, uh, but it is cumbersome. Um, and I will just briefly mention uh, what. The possible solution there is. So um, just to really just tell you how this is actually done. So um, in terms of fluidics, you can you can take uh, you know various approaches. You can go the full do it yourself. Uh, and so here, for example, an example um, uh, particular application of this. So there is uh, the group of Ricardo Enriquez now in, in Lisbon, and they have these Lego pumpy, right? So the, the pumps are actually made of Lego pieces. Uh, Probably the only lab in the world that I know that actually buys lots of Lego to do science, uh, amazing stuff. Um, or in, in our case, we decided to go for an integrated fluidic unit uh, from, from Fluigent to facilitate our, our work. Uh, it's less fun, uh, definitely, but uh, it also gets the job done. Okay, so um, the, the very essential components, right? So that we do, so once you have a, a fluidic system, so either the do-it-yourself, the Lego, or the area, do you need two things? You need a USB card. Um, so here, the National Instruments card. Uh, and this works well for the Nikon. Uh, for the Leica, you actually need a, a, a card, a trigger card that is actually sold by them. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a price difference. But the, uh, and, and so I guess the, the Leica one is much more performing in terms of how many triggers you can do and so on and so forth. Uh, but both work well. And essentially a cable, right? So you're just going to connect. Um, these things. Um, just to show you how actually how that works. Um, so on NIS, you have this device manager, and so you go there, um, and then you can actually uh, you can see what install devices you have. So this will be one particular application. But you have the, the X slide, the spinning disk, uh, and you can add devices. You can actually add an, a national instruments uh, a, a data acquisition card. And so all you have to do is then to configure it, right? So you actually go into the NIDA configuration and you will have then your TTL, so your pulses, which are your inputs and outputs. And so all you have to do is just configure those two guys, um, depending on which ports they are on the on the card. Uh, so just really just connecting the, the cable that I showed you before. And so you bring those here. So you uh, set, uh, configure the, uh, the device and the knees. And once it's done, then you will have this IO tab in these in the ND experiments, which is commonly used by uh, most people. And the fact that you now have this uh, tab uh, available, it allows you to essentially say, okay, give me a TTL device and I'm going to set an input. Um, and so these will actually define the start of the experiment. Um, and uh, and sort of an, uh, an, uh, once once this is done, then all you have to do is set the device output, right? So what's happening at the end? It also sells a TTL, and this is the, the output, um, and then it just has to wait. So that means that 
at the at, at each particular round, right? It's just going to wait uh, that it actually tells you go, and then at the end of that imaging round, it will send it to TL to the device where so all the exchange um, has to be done. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? So then you will you will be ready to do to go ahead with your combined microscopy and fluidics experiment. Um, another possibility to do this with with the Leica. So once you have that trigger card, uh, then in the hardware uh, configuration you have these TTL signals, and essentially you again write your see here your TTL out and in, um, and uh, then what you have to do. So in the main last X. Um, as you, you essentially say, okay, I'm going to use the TTL in, so you actually trigger that to acquisition, uh, and, and you're going to do that at every cycle, and you then use experiment the TTL out as well. And again, right at the end of every cycle after acquisition, you, you create a pulse. And so the beautiful of this thing is that now your triggering of the device, right, in this case, a fluidic unit is entirely controlled by the acquisition software of the microscope, which is fantastic because you essentially just create a time lapse. Uh, which at where at the end of each time lapse, it sends a TTL and it just waits a TTL then to, to restart, right? <clears throat> so just to for com uh, uh, for com uh, for completeness, so let me tell you that uh, on the Lara Seven that's possible, right? Uh, and so the solution uh, uh, that one has to go involves using my pick, which is a uh, software developed by the group of Jan Ellenberg in Heidelberg. Um, this is actually written in Visual Basic because the uh, uh, Lara 7 is in Zen Black, which uh, is essentially made uh, in Visual Basic. And so you have to extend that. Um, and unfortunately, there has no triggers in or out. So then you need um, a Python custom code, which I would be happy to guide you through if you need to, then that has to interface with the fluidics and my peak in order to coordinate between the fluidics and the, um, and the uh, image, image acquisition process. Um, so most likely um, with assembly, right? So the software that is commonly found on the uh, uh, scanning systems, code, uh, scanning confocal systems from, from size, uh, since they're based in Python, so this will be much simpler. Uh, I I know that that's possible, and it's simpler than than sort of this go around. Uh, but I haven't tried that myself. All right. So just to give you a, a um, sort of a look of sort of a feel of how this this goes, right? So uh, we decided to set up uh, Segfish Plus, right? So this is basically uh, based on a on a paper that was published uh, last year, and here essentially do you sort of low do localization based uh, as you do for loop. A super resolution, and you do all this barcoding, and so you have to actually go through 80 rounds of imaging, um, and you can resolve up to 10,000 genes. And that's great, right, for sort of a large scale, so in the case if you're really sort of interested in what's what's going on at this sort of really large scale um, of number of genes. Um, it, uh, so that's the main benefit, the limitations, or sort of the drawbacks to a certain extent, is that you need high magnification, in high NA, because you need to resolve right, you need to resolve the dots that might be too uh, close together, and you also need uh, a high NA to essentially capture as much light as you have. Right, you're actually doing single molecule experiments, uh, so that means that your, your field of view is relatively small, and so it's going to take actually relatively long then to acquire large areas. So for example, a, a whole brain slice or a whole piece of tissue that might take day. Um, and so you know, uh, on a single brain slice, that, that, that uh, this experiment might take actually about a week uh, to complete a, all 80 rounds of, of uh, imaging. So if you have a, a microscope in the facility, that's that's hard, right? Because it means that nobody else can use it. So we really think I have to have a dedicated system in order to, to run these experiments. Um, so this was this was our choice for sort of large scale, right? Um, and how we did this, we actually have, as you see, we have integrated an ARIA unit with a Bioptex uh, FCS2 flow cell. Um, and that actually works. So as I show you, the, the integration with Nikos is actually relatively simple. And that works, uh, it seems to work very nice. Um, so one of the things that, as a limitation is we have to go through 80 rounds of imaging. So there are no 80 uh, uh, positions where you can we can put all the probes. 
Um, and, and this particular uh, Segfish Plus runs a lot of uh, washes and, and, and so on and so forth. So we actually need uh, about six lines uh, of these um, uh, sample holders here just to hold the different buffers that have to be run per imaging cycle. Um, so the, the drop, so the limitation to a certain extent um, is that we have to exchange probes after so every couple of cycles. Um, so that, that essentially will delay the whole experiment even longer. There is no commercial solution or there's actually uh, at the moment just do-it-yourself solution so to, to have a fully automated uh, fluid drop for 80 rounds. Um, all right, um, so for more routine stuff, uh, we're actually working on two other approaches. Um, um, in these, because although as 10,000 genes sounds great, most people don't really want or need to have a look at 10,000 genes all the time, right? And so we're testing two different things. One of them is called Saber Fish. And in Saber Fish, what you do is you amplify your, your essentially your initial uh, primary probe with a, a non-enzymatic cycle. Um, so all the reference uh, appear always at the end, uh, at the bottom of the, the slide. And essentially these allows an, um, the simplification would allow very simple imaging with, uh, for example, with a white field system, right? So you need nothing else than a, the, the, the simple white field with an LED to, to image this. Uh, so this, because it is also enzymatic, en enzyme free, it's cost effective, um, the, the, the amplification. Um, and you have a direct readout signal. So here in this case, there is no barcode, so you don't have to do fancy analysis afterwards. So each color that you see, it will be directly what that type of imaging, uh, the type of RNA that you're looking at. It has limitations. Um, as, uh, so you have to process manual samples every single round. And because you, you know, you're doing all these amplifications for, you may not really go. Um, so in the paper they describe, I think 17, um, I was talking with one of the authors recently. And, and so to go, I think, 10 to 20 is a sort of a good practical approach. More than that, it's, it's, it's not really robust at the moment, the technique. So for that medium term, um, we're actually trying another uh, method it's called uh, in situ sequencing. Um, here you have this, what I call padlock probes, which is sort of the semicircular uh, structure. So these you have five, you have a, your gene of interest is split into pieces. And that, when that binds the target, then you can actually use a ligase uh, and then you use a polymerase, and then you do this rolling circle amplification. And what that does, it really expands uh, the, the binding uh, places for your target, for your imaging strands, for uh, the ones that are coupled with the fluorophore. And so that these really large dots of the order of a micron, they're also very easy to see. You do not need a, any sort of fancy microscope. Um, we, we actually tested several slide scanners. Uh, and so again, the, uh, the advantage of using slide scanners is that you can sort of you know, let the imaging down overnight. So, sorry everyone, it seems that we have a technical issue. Alvaro, can you hear me? Actually, we can't see your screen and uh, we can't hear you. Alvaro? Do you hear me? Hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> So apparently we just... it decided to stop. Um, <laughs> where, which what was the last slide that you heard me? Uh, I don't remember the name of the slide, but uh, it was like a few minutes ago. All right. Uh, do you remember by any chance the slide? So was I was I here? Yes. So you saw that? Uh, did you see this one? Yes. Yes. Did you see this one? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you see this one? Uh, yeah, I think it was this one. I, okay, I can repeat this. Uh, uh, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry. So, no, no, it's okay. Um, so, um, so the other approach that we're trying to test for routine applications um, is in situ sequencing. Um, and this actually can be acquired as, as kits from a company called Cartana that now has been acquired by 10X. Uh, the way that they work is you have these uh, padlock probes, we have this hybridization part split in half. And so only when they bind, they, they really sort of form these. Uh, so only when they bind, they actually come close together. You use a ligase and then you do a, you have a poly, you use a polymerase. And this is called a rolling circle amplification. And so what this 
uh, will do is you have now many binding parts, uh, many binding points for your um, fluorescent labeled oligos. And so you will have very large dots uh, that will work great with a, with a slide scanner. You only need six rounds, so you don't have to do 80 rounds. Um, the limitations of, of this method is that you have to act manually process the samples uh, after every round. Um, it's not that much work, but it takes about two hours, two and a half hours with lots of breaks because there's lots of incubations. Um, but essentially you're limited in, in terms of the number of genes that you can look at, which is about 200. Um, our take on these is, has been that for most common applications, uh, a limit in 200, of 200 genes is more than enough. Um, so whenever we go and talk to people, what, you know, how many genes would they like to see in a routine basis? Uh, the 200 uh, sounds like a, a good compromise in terms of really doing a lot, right? So here you're talking that you could actually produce, um, so in a week you can actually some, uh, you can image on the order of 20 uh, or more uh, slides. And so that actually will bring you to a level of throughput that you could then start thinking of, you know, to have, uh, you know, your wild type, your stress or your animal in different conditions and actually test all those things uh, with, uh, with these type of techniques. The, um, the segfish plus in that sense is much more exploratory. Okay, um, just to show you more or less how the data looks. Uh, so this every dot in there uh, is, uh, is one of those um, amplified. Um, and so the dots are actually under of a micron. So you can you can image the whole brain slides with a 25x, which means that you're also running the, the, the imaging faster compared to the segfish plot. You would need a 60x with a high NA. All right, so um, coming to the towards the end of the talk, um, just want to mention some of the image analysis tools out there. Um, so, you know, um, some of us, uh, or some of you might be very good in, in you know, preparing samples. Uh, I don't count myself among those. Um, um, and then you're sort of always faced with, okay, how do I analyze my data? And at least uh, for some of these uh, sort of omics approaches, there are some tools available. Uh, and for some others, people are sort of still uh, developing them. Uh, and so uh, I just want to briefly mention some of them. Um, there is one particular approach for um, sort of proteomics analysis, where, just, where you have multiple markers on your tissue. The visualization uh, can be done on a program, an open source program called QPath. Uh, and you can actually then export the data for use on a cytomap. So this is, uh, there's a, a, a recent paper um, um, this year, where they produce these sites map. And essentially what it's going to do is going to allow you to do dimensionality reduction, clustering, and all these sort of normal analysis that you do for uh, single cell RNA-seq data, like T-SNEED, UMAP, um, then, and then you can do, analyze your data there and then sort of bring back the results to look for clusters, right? So um, a classical question is like, are, do I have clusters of cells with expressing similar things? And so this could be done for proteins or RNA. Um, this sad, uh, so there are other, I just came up with, uh, just sort of came uh, uh, about these other two. So these recent, really sort of this week was published. Um, there is a, a um, our bioconductor package. Uh, and so they, they really tried to uh, extend. Um, so he's uh, burned as a creator of the uh, imaging mass cytometry. So they're trying to sort of put things together because most of the techniques and the, the real power of many of them is that you, we can actually bring them together. Um, for spatial transcriptomics, unfortunately, there are no ready-made solutions. Um, so I'm really just putting here two um, uh, uh, GitHub repositories. So this is a group of Matt Nelson, who is essentially the one that developed the rolling circle amplification uh, and the GitHub from uh, Long Kai's uh, uh, Caltech, uh, who developed the Segfish Plus. And essentially what you can see is code and then you will have to go through it and sort of adapt it to your own needs. Uh, so you will probably need someone who knows or has some experience in programming. Uh, for Segfish Plus, people are working towards uh, uh, sort of a platform independent analysis pipeline. Um, and this is called Starfish. It, this is Python based compared to the other ones, which are MATLAB based. So in this case, uh, Python is open source. So that's sort of uh, has that advantage. 
Uh, it's still very much beta version, uh, although um, they're very keen on helping you. So if you if you type a question in the image forum, um, they will help you uh, try to find a, a solution to this, uh, to whatever problem you face. Um, and so what do you do after you've decoded your data, either because you did uh, proteome or RNA or gene or whatever. Um, and so there are a few, you know, again, a few tools that are sort of appearing out there uh, with it, how you can map them to, to actually come to the, to the, to the question, okay, how many cell types do I have and how do I see uh, whether clusters and, and all of these uh, sort of interesting biology behind uh, these experiments. And so for visualization, tissue map is very nice. So essentially this is a web base uh, so you sort of download and you just look, point, point it to where your uh, image and your decoded files will be. Uh, and then you can visualize this is really just for visualization. These two are for more for analysis. And Gyoto is more um, is sort of tailored to really try to combine uh, various approaches together, right? So uh, this is Python based. And so again, there's another tool. They, they also have a, a um, they have a video session uh, available as well. And so um, with that, I really um, I'm going to end. Um, hope that you will find some of this information useful um, to decide what the kind of experiment will be good for you. So um, I have to say that this is really a, a, a work from all of the units. So where most of the group leaders, if not all, are, are involved. So this is the neuroscience part. This is the epigenetic side. And everyone is interested uh, either because we can combine the transcriptomics with, with uh, for neural tissue, or we can do connectomics and spatial transcriptomics in the same tissue. Uh, none of this will be possible without our head of histology, who's really the guru for expansion microscopy, tissue clearing, and sample preparation for uh, the various uh, methods that, that I've mentioned. Um, so there will be a, a, a moment for questions. So if you if you want, uh, you can sort of start thinking uh, and then type them on the on the chat. Um, I also would like to thank Marine and Bastien who actually helped uh, set up the, the webinar from Fluigent. I would like to thank Bioptics for the FCS2 flow system, uh, Cartana for the uh, reference slide that I showed, um, and Sinem. Uh, Saka, who's now a group leader in Heidelberg, and she's uh, so she developed a similar approach to the saber fish, but for um, uh, antibody-based markers. So she has a very nice methods, uh, uh, nature methods uh, paper, where essentially what they did is um, uh, using the, the DNA uh, conjugated antibodies, then they use that, and then they actually amplify the signal um, uh, from the antibodies. So essentially, you can you can do the, the, once you have a the DNA couple antibody, you, you can pretty much whatever you want. Um, and so, with that, I would like to thank you um, for the time and patience. Uh, this is the first time that I'm giving a webinar to the empty space. Um, and again, I will be happy to take your questions. So uh, thank you, Alvaro, for uh, your presentation. Uh, there is no question, so maybe we can wait one or two minutes before uh, the webinar ends. So. So don't hesitate to send us your questions in the chat. Uh, Alvaro, we have one question. Mm -hmm. So do you know how to better uh, control the thickness of the expanded gel? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the question is, how, how do I control better the thickness of the expanded gel? Or um, So what we, so for example, for sec fish plus and for some of the 
um, other methods, you, you have to essentially go through the same protocol. And so you have to bind, you have to uh, functionalize your glass and then bind directly the tissue to the glass. Um, what we uh, what we use are these, uh, you have to use like a gasket. Um, so for example, these Grace uh, BioLabs have these uh, punchable uh, plastics or sticky uh, plastic where you can make gaskets of different sizes. And there you can have like very thin um, gaskets for um, for the gel. Uh, and so essentially you, you can fill it and then you sort of uh, put the, 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 the a second glass on top um, and that works uh, that tends to work pretty well. Um, believe me, we've also broken many gels. Uh, one one thing that I that I heard recently um, is there is a recent um, protocol from the, the lab of uh, Jörg Bebasov in, in Yale, um, and they did this pan expansion. And it seems that the at least the second expansion uh, protocol then uh, leads to a very stiff. Um, gel and so if you if you think about expansion microscopy right so well yeah you can do expansion um, for sec fish plus you have to go through the same protocol but without the expansion and so if you increase the concentration of crosslinker um, you can then you will render the gel also thicker and then that might be easier to control so in, in terms of the, thing, the gasket that you have from from grace biolabs is, is a good way to control that Thank you, Alvaro. We don't have any more questions, so uh, we must end the webinar. So uh, thank you again. Uh, so there, there seems to be no other question. So if any other uh, comes up, please feel free to send them uh, at contact at uh, fluigent.com. Uh, we want to thank you again for your participation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Sorry for uh, the little technical problem. Uh, we remind you that a recording of the presentation uh, will be available uh, tomorrow on our platform and our website. So please have a look at our dedicated page for the list of Fluigen's upcoming webinars. And uh, we wish you a pleasant rest of uh, your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.